day. Welcome to the ADF Architecture TV channel. Yet another episode coming up on ADF Architectural Patterns. My name is Chris Muir and I'm, I'm an ADF Product Manager. In today's episode, we're going to look at the next pattern, uh, pattern that is an extension of the sum of the parts pattern, and it's called the cylinder pattern. Now this pattern, like I've said before in some of the previous episodes, well, it will solve some issues for you. It will have some positives, but it also has some negatives. And really, well, let's get into it. Let's actually discuss this particular pattern and we'll see if it's actually suited towards your particular requirements. So as the previous episodes, let's first talk about some of the characteristics of the cylinder pattern. Now, as we already said, the cylinder pattern is really just an extension of the sum of the parts pattern. With the sum of the parts pattern, once we realized we could put functionality off into other workspaces, particularly banded task flows, we quickly realized we can break our application up into multiple different workspaces and we can have quite a flexible architecture based on that one simple little feature, uh, ADF library jars. Now, in this particular pattern, unlike the uh, some of the parts pattern though, with the alternative workspaces, it's not just a, well, go out and create another workspace and throw some banded task flows in it. We're much more interested about making those bounded task flow workspaces, in this case called the cylinders, making them more whole units, making them actually, well, things that where all the bounded task flows are logically grouped around maybe business functions or technical functions. So if you think of a really large application that you might be writing for, let's say a financials application, maybe you might have a business area for payables and you might have a business area for receivables. So one of the goals here is to create, in that example, two cylinders based around payables and receivables and all the bounded task flows that have to do with them, essentially in each one of those workspaces. And in addition, the slight difference between the sum of the parts pattern and the cylinder pattern is rather than putting the model layer off in a common workspace, we're actually going to put the model layer in each cylinder workspace as such. So they are much more self-contained than the sum of the parts pattern where in many ways we went for an extreme break apart or extreme architecture that everything was broken into its own workspaces. Again, as usual, let's look at this diagrammatically. So in the cylinder architecture, like the sum of the parts architecture, we will still have a common workspace and this will contain things which are common such as task flow templates, page templates, declarative components, skins, and other view controller extension type classes. And as usual, the projects that contain them will be published as ADF library jars and re, uh, reconsumed by the rest of the application. But the difference that we get in this particular pattern is when we introduce the cylinder. Now here's cylinder workspace and well, the key difference, and you might have already noticed what's missing from the common, is that it has, the cylinder workspace that is, has its own model project with entity objects, view objects, application modules and framework extensions, and plus the associated banner task layers, which may be one to many. Then again, you may not just have one cylinder workspace, you'll have multiple cylinder workspaces based around that really large groupings of business functionality or whatever large delineation you come up with in your overall application development. Now in context, they will then be published as ADF library jars and the master workspace, just like in the previous some of the parts, will reconstitute those large cylinder bounded task flows back into an unbounded task flow, or I should say through an unbounded task flow, and ultimately be published through an enterprise archive or an ear. What are some of the design considerations for the cylinder pattern then? Well, you might remember in the bounded task flow workspace, some of the parts pattern, one of the questions that got thrown up very early was, well, what should the granularity of your BTFs be? Now that question hasn't really gone away, but now we've actually introduced a new question is, what should the granularity of your cylinders be? Now I use the examples of the financials application broken down into payables and receivables and you can kind of get an idea of the granularity I've specified there but imagine that we had a whole bunch of um, logic that we're bringing together financials, HR, um, procurement all into one application. Now logically each one of those could be a cylinder in its own right or we could even break those down into subparts which are also cylinders. Now it's a little hard again to know how to define where those cylinders are, where the boundaries of those are. It's up to you to come up to that consideration. Though once you pick one and you pick a sort of granularity, you really do want to be consistent across the board. 
I don't think you really want to treat one, uh, one logical business area um, with one large cylinder and then have another logical business area and break it up into 10 cylinders. You kind of need to be consistent across the cylinders as such. Putting aside the design considerations, what are some of the advantages of this particular pattern? Well, there are quite a few and one of the main ones is that when you're building a bespoke or a greenfield application, with the, some of the parts pattern, when we put the model layer off into the common workspace, when the BTF developers working on the different workspaces want changes to that common workspace, and particularly the common model, which on a green field or a bespoke application will be changing quite rapidly, you'll find that overall that the, well, the development tends to bog down a little bit because the way you align your teams is you'll have your banner task flow workspace programmers, each working on a particular band of task flow workspace, and then you'll typically have your team leader or some senior developers responsible for the common workspace and therefore the common model. Now as requests for changes to the EOs, the VOs and the AMs come in to that main common workspace set of developers, they will have to stack and queue those up. And it's not as easy for a BTF workspace developer to come in and say, hey, I just want a new attribute and entity object, can't I just add it myself? Because no, it needs to go through more of a formal process. So this can really bog your development teams down. So as such, the advantage of the cylinder pattern is we go, no, let's put a model in each BTF workspace as such, or what we call the cylinder, and let them basically work on their own EOs, VOs, and AMs. And that is independent of the previous, or the other teams, I should say. So in a way, in, if you watched all the previous episodes, we've come a complete circle because when I started talking about the previous patterns and we eventually broke the pattern or the patterns broke the architecture up into several parts and we basically said we didn't want junior programmers all mashing their code up and all working in the same workspace because they often tightly couple code. Now this particular pattern, we've come right around again. We said, well, no, now it's kind of fine to have everything in a cylinder. You know, maybe we're definitely putting some of the common elements like task flow templates and page templates off in a common area. But now we're bringing all the logical BTFs that are related together into one cylinder and the model layer, and we're allowing the teams to pretty much manage themselves. So that does give me a little point of saying that the earlier patterns, there is a reason to allow, or I guess move to the earlier patterns in order to get junior developers to work in their separate workspaces so they can't hurt each other or hurt each other's development. But later on when you have a more experienced team, then maybe you can bring them back to basically controlling all the code and being careful about coupling and loose coupling and, and modularization. But Hopefully senior and experienced staff will not necessarily have this issue. So, okay, that's one major advantage of this particular architectural pattern, the cylinder. Another advantage, obviously, is that now, previously with the sum of the parts, it wasn't really clear what the delineation of is what bounded task flows go into a BTF workspace. But now what we're attempting to say in the cylinder pattern is that you really want to logically group a whole bunch of bounded task flows and the relating logic into a cylinder, into a kind of a, a unit as such. So this should allow a little bit of clearer thinking in your architecture. And I think it also allows you to do a couple of other things as well. If you think of it from a project management perspective, now project managers are really not going to have too much knowledge about bounded task flows and so on. When they're going to look at a set of requirements for building a new software system, they're going to break it down logically into, you know, like I said before, payables and receivables and so on. So they don't really want to track a thousand BTFs being coded. They probably really just want to track that, hey, today the teams are building the payable cylinder and hey, tomorrow they're building the receivables uh, cylinder as such. So in this way, it kind of aligns to how project management and overall software engineering tasks sort of go along rather than this more abstract uh, architecture that ADF introduces itself to. Another advantage of this pattern, well, maybe this is a pro, maybe this is a con, but now when you're regression testing, okay, at least you can regression test a subsystem or a cylinder as such. Um, with the BTF workspaces uh, that we saw in the sum of the parts, if we wanted to regression test, well, we either had to do the whole application or make a, a call that, hey, that set of BTFs in that workspace, they won't impact any other bounded task or any other part of the application, so then maybe we could just regression test that and get away with it. But there's a bit of a grey line there again. Was that, is that really something we could do? Hard to tell. 
Now what we've done here by bringing our boundaries to a more coarse level is now when we change something hopefully it will be within the cylinder and all we have to do is regression test that whole cylinder but one cylinder won't necessarily affect another cylinder. So in that way well we've broken down the ability to do necessarily the need to regression test the whole application but we haven't broken it down to such a level that we have this sort of mm, I'm not sure if we should go back and regression test the whole application or not. So it's a little bit more advantageous in that way in using this particular pattern. Now let's talk about some of the disadvantages of the cylinder pattern. And one of the very big and obvious ones is, is if we're going to allow each cylinder to have its own model project with its own ADF business components and particularly its own EOs and BOs and AMs, it's pretty damn sure that at some point some of the functionality that you require is going to be duplicated across the cylinders. So you might, for instance, have two EOs and one in each cylinder that points to the customer's table. Now that might be okay, but the flip side is, is what happens if one of your teams makes a change to EO1 or the customer EO in the first cylinder, but the second team forgets to make that change. Maybe they don't need that change to the customer and the object, but maybe they do. Maybe there's a business rule that needs to apply. And because you're now maintaining two pieces of code or three or four, depending on how many cylinders you have, this could be an issue. So this is not necessarily a massive negative. It's just an issue that you need to weigh up. If you're particularly working for a bespoke or a greenfield development, because the model layer is changing so often, the ability to break the model layer off and give it to each um, cylinder team or cylinder development team as such is a good thing. But from a maintenance perspective, it's not a good thing. Hmm. You've just got to weigh it up. Pros and cons of both approaches. Another problem you're going to potentially hit is if you remember that you may have one or two or many cylinders, and in addition, they're all constituted into a master workspace. Now at certain points, different parts of the application will need to be improved or bug fixes or whatever you need to do over the lifetime of the application. And that means that particular cylinders may be upgraded and may need to be versioned separately to the other cylinders. There may not necessarily be a version one of all your cylinders or a version seven of all of your cylinders. You might have cylinder A, at version 3, cylinder B at version 7, cylinder C at version 1. And again, you're going to have to keep track of all of that. Okay, there's no there's no magical thing to say, uh, there's no magical mechanism in JDeveloper or tooling to assist you in keeping track of that. In terms of uh, the, the BTFs and the model layer code all being contained in the uh, cylinder, don't forget we also have the type coupling modularization issue. It's still an issue now. We're just trusting our programmers are good enough that they don't accidentally tightly or couple all the code that when they make their uh, underlying cylinders, which the overall application is going to use, that they still write it in such a way that you can still determine when an error occurs that it probably relates to bounded task flow one in that cylinder rather than mm, maybe bounded task flow one, but I think it might actually use code from, uh, what was it again? Um, I think bounded task flow number two. Um, so again, this may not be an architecture or a particular pattern that's well suited to beginners, but to more senior developers who you've got more trust and have more uh, experience in making good decisions. There is one final issue. Now here we're talking about creating these pretty big fat cylinders now, okay, big cylinders. And we're talking about applications of the scale of financials with payables and receivables, or even applications that are bigger than that, which have HR, procurement, financials, all in them. We're getting to pretty large scale applications now. We're not talking, well, you know, to coin the phrase, we're not talking a Mickey Mouse application anymore. We're talking big, big, big applications. Now an issue with a really big application, we're talking giant applications here is, well, at some point, isn't it possible that you could write an application that will overwhelm the resources of the Java Virtual Machine or the underlying hardware that supports it, the CPU, the memory, the hard disk, and so on and so forth. So this particular pattern, well, it doesn't address this particular issue in the fact that as our applications get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and one day we're going to have an application with thousands of cylinders in it, will it actually be able to run in the machines available on that day? Now that last point there is a really interesting one because that really leads into the next episode.
So in the next episode, we're going to talk about the pillar architecture. And the pillar architecture is specifically designed for very, very large applications that will overwhelm the JVM resources. So in that episode today, we've looked at the cylinder pattern. As you can see, it's the sum of the parts pattern that gives us the inspiration for this particular pattern and that we can break our application up into multiple pieces. But now what we're starting to do is to move some of the functionality around in order to combat some of the advantages and disadvantages that we get into, some of the issues that we get into in terms of the types of our development. In particular, this cylinder pattern is well suited to bespoke and greenfield applications where the model layer and the underlying database is changing quite considerably and we need to um, basically give our teams a bit of flexibility in addressing those changes. But as a reminder, it's also a particularly a pattern that's well suited to more senior developers because with beginner developers, there's still the issue of tight coupling and modularization. So as you can see, there are pros and cons of this pattern. And again, you would need to assess your requirements, your team skills, your business processes, and so on and so forth to work out if this particular pattern is useful to you. So once again, thanks for joining us on the ADF Architecture TV channel. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and stick with us in the next episode where we will look at the pillar pattern, which will address some of the issues that we just talked about at the very end of this episode. Thanks. See you later.